Hi, and welcome back to Crosstalks. We are coming to you live from the library at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. If you just tuned in now, you have missed a mind-expanding talk about cutting-edge research in physics on the very edges of human comprehension. Uh, my brain is still trying to recover from that experience, so bear with me if I appear slightly confused, or also it might just be a dimensional glitch. If you missed that conversation, though, don't be worried. Assuming technology is on our side, it will be available on our website within minutes. Now, speaking of technology, we will focus now on a technological field that started as utopian, moved into our factories, and is increasingly integrated into our everyday lives, robotics and artificial intelligence. I am happy to introduce to you five great natural intelligences uh, here to discuss the ultimate destiny of man and robot. Three of them will be in the room, two will be joining us later on Skype. Torbjörn Tensche is the Christian Klaasson Professor of Practical Philosophy at Stockholm University. Danica Kragic is Professor of Computer Science here at KTH Royal Institute of Technology Stockholm. And Tore J. Larsson is Professor of Safety Management and Occupational Injury Prevention also at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. A warm Warm welcome to you all. Thank you. We'll start with you, Danetha Kragic. Can you explain for us what robots are capable of today? Mm. So as you said um, um, in the introduction, um, it started with industrial robotics. And um, in robots in industry still exist. To summarize, um, uh, a set of pre-programmed robot arms can put together a Toyota car in 23 hours. And no man can do that today. Now we also see robots in um, uh, other applications or in other areas, such as, for example, medical applications, where robots collaborate with surgeons and um, um, help to, to perform surgeries on humans that are more exact than the surgeon would do uh, himself. But we also see robots as um, part of our homes, for example, in dust, uh, so let's say vacuum cleaners that can um, uh, clean floors completely autonomously swipe floors. And we also see robots as, um, I mean, in research labs, uh, robots built as uh, looking as humans, for example, interacting with humans, and also robots that look maybe like animals performing tasks uh, in environments that are maybe difficult for humans to reach. I, I realize, as, as you're explaining this, that, uh, that I'm actually not entirely sure about the distinction between a robot and just a very clever machine. So is there a definition that we should be aware of? Robot is a very clever machine. <laughs> now, uh, a very clever is very difficult to, to measure. What does it mean, very clever? And I think that intelligence in general is very difficult to measure when it comes to humans too. I think that when we talk about clever machines, we talk about machines that can either in collaboration with a human or completely autonomously execute efficiently tasks that are of interest uh, to a human to some extent tasks that are boring to us, like, for example, swiping floors. But the blender is not uh, a robot, so it, it, because, because it doesn't do it itself? Um, no, the, the, the blender is a tool to me. Uh, however, uh, because it's pre-programmed, this is why I said that robots, as we saw them uh, historically in um, uh, industrial settings, are pre-programmed, but they are still called robots because these are machines that do something or perform a certain uh, kind of tasks. Robots that we talk about as researchers, and I think that, that robots that we are also used to uh, seeing in Hollywood movies, uh, are more intelligent machines that can do things completely autonomously and think of how to do things that they have not been programmed or pre-programmed for uh, beforehand. But robots can't really do that today, right? Well, so they can. We, they're they can. not completely autonomous. Or yes, they are. So uh, we do have a robot. So, well, I can start with something that is maybe not a robot, but uh, we have uh, unmanned uh, uh, cars, for example, that can drive on their own. And uh, this is a machine uh, that can react based on the sensory information to the information that is currently available to it. So if there is a pedestrian... Um, uh, 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 passing a street or something like that, the car will stop. And, you know, it, it depends on what it can measure, how autonomous it is. But I don't think the car can decide where to go. No, uh, maybe not, but it can decide to stop. And mm -hmm. I think that that, that is um, um, one way of, of 
deciding, mm. I mean, making a decision based on sensory data is to some extent, absolutely not deciding. I'm just pointing out that there's probably a man or a woman that has decided where to decide to, where, where to go. send the car. But then yeah. that's true about industrial robots as well, of yes. course. You need to tell them what, what, what to do and, and what to look out for when there's trouble in the system somehow. But that is interesting because, because it would seem that I'm just trying to like establish the field that we're talking about here, but but yes, of course, we we already know about these sort of, well, uh, driverless cars. Th that mm -hmm. seems to be a reality. Yet when we look at films, as I have been doing very interestingly on YouTube for the last week, looking at films of robots in labs, those seem to have great problems doing simple tasks like figuring out where the walls are and stopping and so on. Why why can the car do it so well and the robots that you're building here, for instance, find it so challenging? Uh, well, they can do it. Uh, uh, from the scientific point of view, detecting walls and detec de detecting different hinders and objects, it's to some extent a solved problem. Mm. Um, um, but um, there is still a challenge of, for example, uh, defining or seeing a difference whether uh, there is a piece of a clot on the floor or if there is a child of two years, you know, just, just uh, uh, sitting on the floor. So I think that, and this is something that is also for, for humans uh, difficult to do. So seeing somebody hiding, for example, underneath mm -hmm. a table or something like that. Uh, humans use lots of other type of information, which is uh, experience, for example, using information about what we used to, to, to see in, in, in a certain setup, and then uh, uh, this information is mm -hmm. reused mm -hmm. in our brain. For robots, this is still a challenge. Yes. So, uh, you know, storing the information and then using the information that is contextual based on the, 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 the place or the environment where, where, where they are. That's great. The, I feel we have established perhaps the, the state of the field in a very general way. Let's mm -hmm. also introduce now our Skype participants. Uh, let's see, Rujena Bai, she is Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Baishi, are you with us? <coughs> yes, hello, yes. I can hear you. Yes. Uh, welcome here. to Cross Talks. Thank you, thank you. And uh, here now. And there we are. Yeah. Welcome to Cross Talks, yeah. madam. And also Alastair Reynolds, the best selling science fiction author with a long first career as a scientist at the European Space Agency, should be joining us from Wales. Alastair, are you with us? I am indeed. Hello. Yes, there we are. Hello, welcome to Cross Talks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to you both. Um, I think uh, I, would, I would like to, Professor Baishi to ask you um, this question. Uh, many of your projects involve human-machine interfaces in different ways. For instance, this one is my favorite, looking at equipping cars with a kind of artificial intelligence that could take over and drive itself if the human driver starts behaving erratically. So sort of mixing the idea of a robot car and, uh, and, uh, and an ordinary car. Yeah. But if what Danitza just explained about robot perception being very difficult uh, is correct, how can we teach machines to judge human behavior and react appropriately? Uh, very good question. That's what we call the million dollar question. Because uh, the, uh, the, the only thing I, we're losing a little bit, I'm afraid. We, I heard that it's the million dollar question. Okay. Yes. yes. The, the problem I find is that actually machines have to sell. Sorry, ma'am, could, could you possibly move closer to the microphone? Maybe that might help? Yes, 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 I am coming. Oh. Um, better, better, thank you. Yeah, the, the, the issue to me is that machines have to cooperate with people. And the, the idea of having a society completely um, isolated or independent of the machine, including the autonomous drivers, is uh, not uh, very appealing nor acceptable. So all my focus is on how to make machine uh, cooperate in a best in an optimal way with the with the humans. Mm. Now, in order to do that, we really need to understand the behavior of humans um, from the perspective of the machine, so mm. that the machine can react properly to the human 
intent and, and interaction. Now, the big issue here is that I can observe your physical activities, how you move, how your eyes are moving, how your, maybe even your facial expression, but I cannot crawl into your head. No. So, yes. assessing the mental state is really a challenge, and so far, unless we assume that we will be carrying some electrodes on our heads, which I don't think that any of us are very uh, willing to do that, it will have to be a very indirect, indirect assessment of the human intention. Yes. And, that, and that's a real challenge for the machine responding properly to the human behavior. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to, I think, re-repeat re some of this because it might have been very difficult to catch in the room. So, so the real challenge is to make the machine understand human intention, uh, particularly since, I mean, the, the, so the machine can observe things like eye direction and, and physical movement, but of course it can't, uh, and maybe even facial expressions uh, will be possible to read in a machine way. But since we are not willing to wear electrodes on our head while we drive, it will be very difficult for the machine to judge when we are actually sort of losing control or, or being distracted. So, so that is a, uh, mm -hmm. a big challenge. And, and already, I think, we're, we've, we've entered a f an area which will be at the core uh, of this conversation, which is about how the machines and the human society and, and, and I think, I guess, abstract ideas like freedom uh, interact uh, with each other. I, Torben. As a quick comment on this. I mean, Aren't we in the same predicament uh, when it comes to the kinds of information we can rely on? When we I want human. to know how you think, I have to go on your, your behavior, so to speak. Uh, even electrodes on your head wouldn't help me. So, so the difference must be something else. It's not the method you, you derive the information, but, but rather, I suppose, that, that I can sympathize with you. I have also uh, consciousness uh, I have a mind, so to speak, uh, and that might be helpful when I try to understand you because you also exercise those mental capaci capacities even when you drive your car. But robots won't for a very long time. For a very long time, <laughs> but, but of course, well, I mean, I we should perhaps also that discuss long, that. Actually. I, no? No. No, no. no I, I've started to do the specs for my home care robot that I'd like in 15 years' time. <laughs> and I. I would like it to be as sensitive to me as my golden retriever is. <laughs> and I know that that's because the golden retriever has a hearing which is much better than mine and can sense when I'm distraught or, or if I'm angry. Uh, and a robot should be able to do that. That's, yeah. I'd like the robot to be able to be able to pick me up if I've fallen. Mm. I'd like it to be uh, censored to the stuff, my vital data, and probably ask me how I feel when mm. he can feel that my blood pressure is a bit too high. Mm. But all of those things are, you know, it, it won't take 15 years. It'll probably but, but be done. But still, I mean, mm. uh, perhaps there is a, this is a distinction with, without any difference, but... but uh, many people would say so. If you are capable of doing all those things, then you have mental capacities, then you have consciousness. I mean, you, that's a behaviorist position, of course. But I, I have the feeling here that uh, there is still a difference. So even if you could act as though you had this inner life, it's different from having it. And, and I, I think that it's possible to give also this inner life to machines sometimes, but I, I guess that that is. So far what you're saying is that when, when the, the robot is asking how you feel, mm. Turbion feels that it's important that the machine means it, that the machine cares about your answer, and you just wanted to ask you that so that it can help you if you're in trouble. Well, I think my dog cares about me. <laughs> Yes. I, can't, I can't see the difference here. I, and no, I'm, I'm I, sure I, I know agree. people I agree that have the dog, no inner life I agree about the dog, but I would like to see that kind of robot. That, uh, mm. I, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, we will meet that kind of robot, but, but we, we're not close to that. Uh, that to the, uh, uh, very simply put, your, your field is uh, workplace safety. How are robots already affecting working environments for humans, and where do you see that going? Oh, that's, that's been happening for Long probably 100 time. years. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm particularly interested in how we're going to live until we die, uh, because I think we live integrated in our own homes until mm -hmm. the final moment. And in that case, uh, work life for people that will look after people in their home will be, will be uh, quite robotized, I think, mm -hmm. both with intelligent machines that will help those that work, but also maybe as substitute, as, as uh, intelligent companions. There yeah. are some demographic reasons mm -hmm. uh, well, in, yeah. in the Global North why we would need more, more, more robots to care for the elderly. Yeah, in the certainly. industrialized world. But wouldn't you, wouldn't you ideally have a person? Or is, is there to you, do you seem to really want the robot? Is it just because robots are cool or is it because you don't want another no. person snooping around your affairs? No, but uh, there's, there's a, if, if we're be, uh, being quite realistic now, there's, there's a great shortage of staff in, in aged care. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a shortage already, and uh, there's going to be a big, big bulge in demographics. Uh, people in my age will uh, be a lot larger group in society mm -hmm. in 25 years. And uh, I think we'd, we need to be looked after. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's manpower enough. But, but so, it, yes, sorry. If I can, yeah. So, so I just wanted to go back a little bit to what we have discussed regarding the intention and understanding the intention of a human. Uh, like for us, you know, it's training. If I meet you for the first time, right, I will somehow project what I would do in a situation that you do and then try to, you know, think about what you will be doing next as if I would do it if I was in the, in the same situation. This is how we understand each other, right? Uh, when we marry somebody and spend, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years with somebody or the whole life, that person does not necessarily need to speak anymore what, what he feels or what he intends to do. You use, you know, body... Uh, 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 kind of features and and, uh, and how they you know just <laughs> small kind of features to understand their intention and this is where systems that observe us are under uh, longer periods of time come into play the more they look at us the more that they can measure how we look and what we do and what we say, the more they can understand or predict our intentions. So mm -hmm. everything is training. So as you have said, maybe not necessarily we would like to have robots, but we would like somebody that spends long time with us so that I don't need every day to explain a new person that comes and helps me to, mm -hmm. to put my bed in order. This is how I use this is how I'm used to do it. Yeah. And this is what you can do with the machine, right? You can instruct the machine several times of how to do certain things, or the machine can observe you and then learn from your instructions. And this is what we want. We want the continuity. We want somebody that is around for a longer periods of time and understands us and you know. did, did, when, we, when you talk about this, you make it sound like it really will happen in our, in our lifetimes. Really? When in my case, well, I have to say, we're still in science fiction territory, and yeah. I would like uh, to bring Alistair in for this reason. Uh, first, Alistair, do you have any, any immediate comment? Well, I, I would agree that uh, these, the, 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 the bulge in terms of our population demands is something that appears to be forcing robotics on us yeah, at, at a pace that perhaps we didn't anticipate uh, a few years ago. I mean, certainly in, in Japan, uh, there's a tremendous initiative in terms of equipping the population to survive uh, in the coming decades when there's simply going to be a, a huge number of old people. And, you know, it, it's, it's not just uh, robotics. There are also uh, a great deal of uh, work going on in things like um, exoskeletons so that uh, people who work in nursing homes can, can lift move people around mm -hmm. so the, you know the japanese are certainly taking this very seriously and we you know I, societal, mm -hmm. societal trends over the years the japanese tend to tend to be ahead of the curve uh, i would also like to ask uh, about your novels celeste you're, you're they're very scientific indeed your science fiction novels and they concern themselves quite a lot with space travel do you think what do you think, realistically, the, the role of robots will be in space exploration, now that we're finally doing space exploration again, which is very exciting, of course? It is tremendously exciting. Uh, well, the, the, the fundamental problem with space is that it's very big, and it takes uh, you know, a long time to send a radio signal anywhere. So we, we have this dichotomy that it is, at the moment, cheaper to send robots to places like Mars and the outer planets. Uh, it's much, more, much cheaper than sending human beings who, who require complex life support systems. 
But at the same time, uh, those robots are, uh, you know, many, many light seconds away from being able to, to be directly controlled. So even with the, the, the robot that was landed on Mars uh, last summer, um, the robot must, of necessity, have a measure of autonomy so that it can take decisions in real time. Because if you have to wait hours and hours for um, from the OK from mission control before you you know you move forward an inch, then you, you almost never get anything done. So I think again we have we have this a push towards increasing robot autonomy, but uh, at the same time that means that those robots will become increasingly complex and increasingly perhaps even human, in my opinion, you know on a time scale of centuries. That's actually very good because of course the, those developments will immediately be put to work in all of these other fields of of robotics. I think yes. turbion tension ethics, of course, being your core mm. field, there is a pretty high awareness in society in general uh, of ethical issues relating to biomedical research. And this is def reflected also in the field of philosophy, where, where ethics uh, in, in those questions are, are very much uh, azure. But how much of an ethics conversation is there among philosophers uh, about robotics? Uh, well, to some extent, the questions are the same, of course. I mean, these post-human ideas that, that we might replace human beings by robots or by, by genetically engineered continuations of ourselves, so to speak. And that has been discussed a, a lot. But I think those more mundane questions that we are now raising are, are, of course, discussed, but not as much as they should be, I think. If we have those robots uh, uh, taking care of us, not only when we're old, perhaps, they are so good at responding. We could even have sexual intercourse with them. We could have them as our friends. And, and they are never problematic in a way. They are always kind to us. Um, what if, if we come to prefer that kind of, of social relations to the, to the, so to speak, real ones? Is that a problem or not? Well, some philosophers of a Kantian bent, of course, would say, that unless they really are rational beings like us, uh, they are just good at pretending, then there is a big issue here. We, we are degrading ourselves by, by using them as mere means to our satisfaction rather than, than interacting with one another. But on the other hand, there are philosophers like me who are hedonist utilitarians who, who could, in principle at least, welcome that kind of perspective. And I think this is a genuine problem here that has not been discussed, uh, at least not to the extent that it should be discussed, even though it crops up. I'm in the ethics bo ethical board of, of the health care system, uh, the, the uh, social steers and directing health care in Sweden. And there it comes up when, when, when old people are offered, as people think, those kind of uh, gadgets instead of genuine human contact. And mm -hmm. there is concern, of course. But, but in principle, perhaps it's not a then big a, deal, really. Mm. Do, do you find it a little bit offensive, this idea that robots are, are lesser beings? Um, <laughs> I mean, they are now, but that they ultimately will be. You looked a little bit concerned. If I'm, if I'm offended, not, I, I, I wouldn't say so. I think that, that um, you know, do, doing the research um, in that field, you actually see the possibilities. And uh, what I think is important is that we actually need to accept the fact that there are some humans that are not capable of interacting with other humans or mm -hmm. with other uh, beings, uh, biological beings in general. Uh, we talk about people that maybe have a dementia. We talk about people that have different, you know, mental disorders and so on. And I think that in those cases, of course, uh, um, it might be um, uh, a good thing to actually have a machine that they interact with because they cannot hurt a machine, although that might also become an ethical question. What is that we are allowed to do towards machines? Um, uh, so there are, there are aspects of those. Uh, now, how we live our life and what, what's real, what's not real. I don't think that that necessarily you know, um, uh, follows with robotics solely. Uh, we do have people living in cyberspace in different, you know, playing games and things like that. So I think what is important is to see how is the generation that comes after mine or two generations after mine, what is real to them? Mm -hmm. How does their brain react to actually have something that we consider is real and something that we consider is not real? So, you know, maybe it's not mm -hmm. going to be any more perceived 
the, the same mm -hmm. way as we perceive it, because they are used to some other type of contact and to some other type of reality. Yeah, well, certainly we've stopped. Uh, I mean, still 10 years ago, we used to talk about very much about the Internet as the opposite of the real world. Mm -hmm. and, and more and more with us carrying the Internet with us wherever we go, that's just not a relevant distinction anymore. Now maybe we think of the physical world and the di digital world as the dichotomy or something, mm -hmm. something like that. But when you, when you raise this question it, it, about when you mentioned not being able to hurt humans, of course uh, this raises immediately some other kinds of ideas like prisons where the guards would be robots or, or uh, the astounding sums that the military industrial complex is, mm -hmm. is pouring into robots. And, and it would seem that, I mean, the kind of research that you do, for instance. Mm -hmm. At the other end, yeah. th these robots might be used to hurt people. Uh, and how, how do we, how, do, how, do, how does the field handle that? Uh, okay, uh, so um, I think that throughout the history, mm -hmm. um, mankind has been building other things. Um, we can talk about chemical weapons, we can talk about nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. you know. Um, a technology can always that is that is that was originally meant for for good purposes. It can always be misused. Mm. But on the other hand, we need to think about history and um, uh, you know re really see that there are even if we do have access to to all these things, they are not misused in mm. a, some form of a, you know general level where where half of the earth is, is destroyed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that what is important to have in mind is that there are rules and there are laws and that I don't see that the technique, um, even if we, you know, our vision of future is very, very much rooted in Hollywood movies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that most of the robots that have been portrayed in movies are villains. How many movies do we remember where there was a good robot? Wally. -E. Wally, -E, yeah. But that's, you know, one of many. So I think that... I think I that, think that was. The, how, how we see it is because mm. we have seen it well, in movies. Okay, let's talk about that. Most of us are still getting our concepts of ro what robotics can do from science fiction, if, whether it's Blade Runner or, or the Isaac As Asimov novels or mm. something like that. The, that shapes both our goals, our dreams and our fears. So how much is science fiction affecting the di directions and goals of scientific research? When it comes to home care, very little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. real, real problems. Not no, much at all, no? Yeah, well, I, I, I would say that, you know, as a researcher, mm. you need to be visionary and uh, you need to think future mm. and you need to have crazy ideas, right? Mm. So I think that from that uh, perspective, um, um, we are guided maybe by a will of building something that, that we don't have right now. Mm. So really making, you know, a footprint and, uh, oh, this is something that I have done uh, and I was the first in the world. Sorry, Alistair, yeah. when, when you were uh, a space scientist, were you guided by science fiction in your goals? Uh, I have had an interest in science fiction and space science for as long as I've been, a, you know, been alive. So it's very hard for me to say which one uh, shaped the other. But uh, the, the, the work I was doing as a space scientist was very, very focused on a particular area of astronomy. So it never felt like it had anything to do with my sort of interest as a science fiction reader or writer, mm. which have always, which always been much more, um, I suppose, about this, you know, the, the post-human condition or cosmology or contact with extraterrestrials. We also weigh out questions. Mm. Um, but in the Western science fiction tradition, and, and writing about robots got, goes back much farther than the word, perhaps 200 years or something like that. And, and since the very beginning, there has been this idea that humans and, and robots would mix in different ways, that one would replace the other, or they would be, there would be, we would have these hybrid forms. And it always, always, you have this idea of the independent robot that can decide for yourself. Mm. And then what that requires, of course, is artificial intelligence. Mm. Um, I wonder, Professor Baishi, are, are, I mean, you are in artificial intelligence, so are, uh, is your field aiming consciously to build the conscious robot? Is that the goal, goal for you? Uh, I need to correct you. I'm more roboticist. More than roboticist, than yes. It is true that my initial education was in the artificial intelligence laboratory, um, but um, I, I really, honestly, I want to remind the viewers that actually the word robot came from Karol Chapek in 1938. It 
when he observed the Hitler uh, military exercises and how they were, you know, acting sort of on command and, and so and then he kind of in, in some ironic fashion put the robots that could could uh, replace people in the, in the wars. Mm. So the idea really goes way, way back. But I, I'd like to say that that we can view robots as more complementary to our daily lives, especially now with the aging society mm. coming, coming on in, in certainly in the developed world, but even in China. There are definitely, uh, as we age, our, our physical capabilities uh, are, are diminishing. Thank you. On a mental level, it's a much more difficult problem, and I, I shy away from that part. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Professor Barshi shies away from this, mm. but I'm not quite, quite going to let it go. Alastair, okay. As, now, you, you must be the resident visionary. How do you view uh, the convergence of humans and, and machines? Yeah. Well, science fiction, there's sort of two strands to it. There's the sort of familiar type of science fiction, which we might see in films, where robots are often portrayed as a sort of threatening development, which you know, we, we create them, and almost immediately they want to wipe us out or take over the planet. But I think within, within sort of literary science fiction, there's a, there's a somewhat more nuanced, uh, thoughtful uh, handling of the topic. And particularly as we, you know, robots are a real-world development now. There's lots of exciting things going on in the laboratory. And that's feeding back into science fiction. And I think you know, we, are, we are beginning to see uh, a more realistic, integrated uh, view of our future as a society in which people and robots collaborate and coexist. And for me, that's far more interesting than the idea of robots sort of rising up and, and sort of trying to wipe huma humanity off the face of the planet. But what about humans with machine parts, for instance, converging from, in, from that direction, from the humans and out? It's very, very difficult to build a, a, a robot that behaves like a human. But it's, well, as Professor Bash also said, some humans be, behave as robots already. So mm -hmm. giving them machine parts and, and enhancing them in different ways, it would seem to be an easier way to, to, mm -hmm. to find this cyborg. Fusion. I think, you know, I think the, the, the whole question of convergence is generally interesting because on one level we have uh, there are people walking around with, with implants in their eyes, in their brains. Uh, people now have a uh, possibility of prosthetic limbs that are wired directly into the nervous system. Uh, Google glasses are coming on online very soon and you know before you know it, you'll want them embedded in your eye itself. Mm -hmm. So we are, you know, we are slowly becoming, or some of us anyway, are slowly becoming cyborg organisms. And I think with robots, we will demand of robots that they, that they seem, certainly the robots that we are obliged to interact with in our daily lives, whether it's in nursing homes or in our own homes or out in the world, we, won't, we will not want them to, to feel too robotic. We will want them to, to have at least the illusion of free will and some unpredictability in their behavior. And I think once we go down that path, we, you know, we, we're on the very, very slow road to some kind of convergence. Uh, centuries in the future, perhaps. But I think the, the distinction between human and robot may become less of less importance to us as we move into the future. Danitza looks very happy when you say that. I'm a little <laughs> bit worried. Ture, how do you feel about this idea of biologically enhancing humans or, and or giving them machine parts, for instance, to make us more suitable for our jobs? Now, this sounds like science fiction, but this, it, it is already happening, and mm. certainly we will see more of this. Mm. I mean, in our, within our professional... Uh, lifetimes. Yeah, uh, I, I see no ethical problems with that at all. Not uh, at all? No. No. I think there's, there, there's probably one more important ethical issue in this, and this uh, has to do with access to this technology. Uh, what is it going to cost? Will I be able to afford my uh, intelligent companion mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. I'm uh, 85 and um, I'm, mm -hmm. all my funds are, are dried up? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, mm -hmm. how is this... Uh, access to technology dispersed in the population. Uh, those that really need it, are they going to get it? And uh, how, how are they going to pay? 
I'm, I'm just I'm worried about about the legal ramifications, these kinds of things. I mean, again, workplace safety. We we have enough difficulty with with make, making uh, the the legal frameworks to protect the people who work with ordinary kinds of of machines. If you give the machines free will, should they have workers' rights for starters? And also. The, the ideas of responsibility, I think, become very blurred mm. when you give non-human entities just, just agency. Just a quick philosophical note uh, on, on the free will. On the free will, yeah. I, I, don't, <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think yes. we should identify it with unpredictability. I mean, uh, mm. that's not the way we conceive people who, who have... Uh, I mean, it's a difficult question whether we have it or not and in what sense we have it. But, but the reason when we attribute uh, free will to, to someone is not because this guy is unpredictable. It's rather that this person do not act out of character and mm -hmm. has some kind of mm. core uh, mm. that we could trust on. So, so it might be easier, I think, to, to create free will, or, or it might be even easier, perhaps, mm -hmm. to, to make it uh, unpredictable. But, but still, I, the notions should be kept in place, I think, in, in, in this way. But, but uh, would you agree, uh, would you as a philosopher agree that, that, there mm. is, that there should be or is perhaps some kind of distinction uh, between ideas of agency in, mach in machines built by humans and agency in humans themselves? And again, I, I think we, we are using we, but I mean, w robots are being used in wars as we speak, drones, of course, being one problematic technology, and uh, we know that, that we are looking very carefully at how to be able to make the drones uh, completely in the independent. Yeah. Now they're being flown, of course, by human yeah. pilots. But also things like pack animals in the field, robots that shoot at people. These are being tested in, in wars that are happening in the world right now. It would be uh, terrific, of course, if all wars could be fought in the desert by, by robots, mm. uh, uh, killing <laughs> off one another. So or not have like wars a, at all, so it was, maybe. It was, yeah, that would be even better. No, we have to like get a rid of all tournament. Like, that would yeah. be terrific, but what <laughs> happens in real life, it, it becomes an access question. On yeah. one side you have people who don't yeah, have robots, yeah. and on the other, I, so the I human cost that, of yeah. war is and becoming there's, less. There's another aspect, I think, to this ethical question. Uh, of course, this kind of equipment that we need, we should provide for everyone who needs it, but... but but it's also this uh, interface that we could, um, together with the robots, get new senses and cognitive enhancement in, in all sorts of ways. I think a problem, I, I'm utterly skeptical about uh, the importance of uh, cognitive enhancement in, in the sense that I don't think that you become happier because you become more clever in those ways. <laughs> you get an, you get a competitive advantage in a competitive society if you have those capacities. But, but if you judge from happiness studies and so, it seems as though you could be equally happy without some of your senses and, and uh, perhaps even more happy if you're not that clever mm. in the way you measure it in uh, IQ scores and so, so I think that yeah, it's sorry. a problem here with, with the goal of, of this uh, development. Uh, perhaps mm. it's misdirected in a way. But mm. I'm not even sure what the goal of the development is because, no. because mm. the, the robotics field seems to be building, it, building robots because they're awesome. <laughs> no, and and also really. to no, solve no, no, real no, problems. No, no I, yeah. uh, th that needs to be made clear. I mean, we want to build useful machines. Mm. That, that, I think, is really, really important to say. Mm. Now, there are different branches, right? Uh, if, you, if you build a machine that uh, in, in some form um, uh, resembles human completely, hardware-wise and software-wise, if we can rebuild a new human, did we understand then a human better? So that, that you know, we, we do trial and error things. So you build things incrementally and then you build something and understand a human rather than going and opening somebody's head and measuring what's happening in the brain where you do this and that. So, so you know, uh, from, from that visionary point of view, and we are very, very far away from, from building uh, flesh and bones and everything that, that uh, can put together a completely artificial human. So we want to build useful machines. We want them to do things that are boring for us, that are dangerous for us. So that, that needs to be made clear. And uh, that's not all that easy because the environment around us has been built for this kind of a body. Mm. And it, even for disabled people, uh, it's not so very easy, you know, to, to, to go just wherever and uh, to walk freely on the street and so on. So um, the fact that, that humans do 
uh, look, uh, sorry, that robots do look like humans and mm. that we try to build robots that have legs and so on, is just to, you know, um, uh, allow them uh, um, to, to be, or the environment around us to be accessible to them. And I think that this is really important to, yes. to, to, to have in mind. Um, uh, one of the current challenges is to actually build artificial hands that have mm. the same capability as the human hand, and that shows to be very, very uh, uh, difficult. And there, of course, the use would be prosthetics. So well, those prosthetics, are practical, because, you know, if we, can build, if we can build an artificial hand, then we can put it actually on a human that has lost uh, mm. his hand, and then we have actually do and done something good. And it can help me good. to play the clarinet better? Yes. Mm. Yes. Not yes. better, yes. but no. it can no. help you okay. to play the so, clarinet oh. if you have lost your hand, which yeah. you cannot do anymore, no. mm. and yes. you're not maybe as happy no. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's time yeah. for audience questions. Already we are, we could talk oh, about oh. this for hours, I feel. <laughs> Do you have a question, sir? You look like you have a question. Yes, please stand up and tell us your name and from which institution mm. you are. Hello, my name is Amir. Uh, actually, my question is regarding this, uh, the, you, as you know that uh, nowadays in the news you heard that some uh, group of the academians and the Nobel Peace uh, winners, uh, they actually, uh, they urge, uh, um, they, uh, or, uh, they launched a international champion to urge the world leaders to stop uh, production of the killer's robots or being developed nowadays for the future wars. And the, as you know that the, the principle, the first principle for the robots is be, help and protect the mankind. But uh, my question is uh, if we uh, per develop the ultra intelligent machine, how we can control it. Maybe in the future they lead us and they take control of the world. Well, how the Thank border you. should be. Thank, Thank you. you, Amir. That's very mm. interesting. So, yes, Nobel mm -hmm. Prize winners trying to limit uh, the development of, of fighting machines. Uh, I think perhaps wisely. Mm. Should we be very worried about this? Um, I think that we are already living in the society where the infrastructure uh, and uh, communication and everything is um, uh, stored and led by machines in different ways. You know, before the turn on the 2000, mm -hmm. we have been talking about, oh, what is going to happen and uh, all, all machines and computers are basically uh, going to be, you know, broken, there's going to be some big error and so on. That's actually not the case, and uh, you know, big uh, things are not happening. Uh, even if uh, lots of the infrastructure around us is actually controlled by machines. Now I'm talking about computers. I'm mm. not talking about embodied machines. So I wouldn't be scared because if we are able to do this with a large scale infrastructure already, where there is much more information going on and being, uh, 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 you know, uh, sent around, why wouldn't we be able to uh, then? Control control one, one machine. Alistair, do you agree? Well, I think the, the, the degree to which military robots will pose a threat to us is really in the hands of the designers and the militarists. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, uh, a lot of those um, the drones that we hear about, are, are, you know, they are not autonomous uh, in, in the true robotic sense, but certainly there is a push towards robotic military technology with full autonomy. And I, I, I find it very disturbing, but I see that, uh, unfortunately, we, we cannot have uh, progress in development of robotics in one field without the, uh, the sort of slightly unpleasant consequences in another. It's like any technology. Yeah. It's essentially, um, it's ethically neutral, and it's up to people what they do with it. And I feel that this is the case with robots as well. Yeah, it was a joke, of course, when I spoke about those robots uh, <laughs> waging wars against one another. Uh, it's so unrealistic. But, but it is realistic, I think, to, to legislate how war should be uh, allowed to, to be. I mean, it would be even better, of course, to do away with wars to, uh, altogether. But I think there should be regulation against uh, these kinds of warfare that, that is already illegal, I think, mm -hmm. under I th I existing think laws of uh, Amir referenced a, a, a law of robots, which I think comes from Asimov, of course, where yeah. in mm -hmm. which in this yeah. fictional universe, all robots are equipped with certain rules, like you can't ever mm -hmm. harm a exactly. human. Yeah. Uh, finally, yeah. then, would, it, would this be a good plan? Should we just have a global agreement that we're going we're, we're to build the most advanced, wonderful robots, but they're not allowed to hurt, hurt humans? 
I mean, this, this is, a, uh, of course, a natural thing, and I don't think that this, will, this is questionable or it will ever be questionable. Mm -hmm. I mean, machines we can control and humans we can't. So I don't know why, why you know, we are so afraid and discussing these things when we are actually, I think that the mankind is threat to itself much more than the machine are threats to, to, to the mankind. Tore? Well, how do you stop war? Uh, can we have a moratorium on uh, nasty robots? <laughs> you're looking, uh, your answer is no, I think, yeah. okay. <laughs> Turbion, do you, how do you feel about this? Is realistic no, I mean, th then we're back to the free will problem again, I think. <laughs> if you really construct robots with free will and superior uh, intelligence, th then we, I, I think uh, my colleague Nick Boostrom has really used this as one of the arguments why, why we should take all sorts of precautions because, I mean, we may put an end to ourselves, uh, we might go extinct just because we have created those robots. I think it's a genuine threat, but, but perhaps not a very imminent one. There, there are <laughs> other problems that should perhaps concern us more today. We're running out of time, but very briefly, Professor Barks, yes or, yes or no, should we give harm, should we make robots incapable of harming humans? No. No. <laughs> Alistair, yes or no? <laughs> No, and it's impossible anyway. We could never embody a, mm. the, the ethical set of ethical instructions in a robot that would enable it to make that decision. Very well. Thank you so much. Turbjörn Tensjö, Danica Kragic, Turi J. Larsson, Alistair Reynolds and Rujina Baishi. We will be back on the hour with a conversation on the global health gap. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you.